Good evening. It's good to be back with you after being on vacation for a couple of weeks. And I guess you guys have proven to me that all those years where people said, we wish we had Thursday night services beyond Labor Day, I guess you were telling the truth. It's good to see so many of you here tonight uh, as we celebrate the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. As we do so this week, our worship encourages something that might sound simple, showing Christian love. But as we learn tonight, sometimes that involves taking some difficult actions and offering some tough words, which we as Christians should still be willing to do. The order of service is the service of word and sacrament. We will be celebrating communion tonight. Our opening hymn is hymn number 492.
Please stand for the invocation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins. And trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. <laughs> for the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. O Lord, let your continued mercy cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. first lesson this evening is recorded in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet. 
We read from chapter 33, verses 7 to 11. The Lord gives Ezekiel a difficult task as he tells him to announce to Israel about their wicked ways. It was a message of law, but at the same time, it was a message of love, trying to get God's people to repent. But I have appointed you, son of man, to be a watchman for the house of Israel. So whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you are to warn them from me. When I say to a wicked man, wicked man, you shall surely die. If you do not speak to warn the wicked man against his way, that wicked man will die because of his guilt, but I will also hold you responsible for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die because of his guilt, but you will have saved your life. So you, son of man, say the following to the house of Israel. This is what you people are saying. Certainly our rebellion and our sins weigh us down, and because of them we are rotting away. How then can we live? Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from their way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Here ends our first lesson. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 51, part A. It is a psalm of David, and we will echo his words tonight, words of repentance. The congregation will sing the refrain, and the glory be to the Father. My wife and I will be singing the verses of Psalm 51A. Our second lesson is recorded in St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. 
We're reminded by Paul that because of God's love toward us, we owe a debt of love toward our neighbor, including our leaders. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities, for no authority exists except by God, and the authorities that do exist have been established by God. Therefore, the one who rebels against the authority is opposing God's institution, and those who oppose will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Would you like to have no fear of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from him, because he is God's servant for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes, because the authorities are God's ministers who are employed to do this very thing. Pay what you owe to all of them. Taxes to those whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and if there is any other commandment, are summed up in this statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, so love is the fulfillment of the law. Here ends our second lesson. Alleluia. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it. Rejoice. Alleluia. Please stand out of respect for the gospel of our Lord. The gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. A portion of this will be our sermon text for tonight. Jesus encourages us to call to repentance those who have sinned against us, but that we should do it out of love for their souls. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. Amen. I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen, I tell you again. If two of you on earth agree to ask for anything, it will be done for them by my Father, who is in heaven. In fact, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Be seated for our sermon hymn, hymn 490.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon tonight is based on the gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. Dear friends, knowing what to say under difficult circumstances is a real gift. For instance, there are some people who know just what to say when dealing with those who are feeling depression. And how many of us haven't gone through that in the last several months? There are also individuals who are really good at bringing comfort and hope to those who are grieving, maybe over the loss of a loved one. Certain Christians also have the special talent to talk about their Savior with other people who don't yet know the Lord Jesus in their lives. Knowing what to say in those certain circumstances is not always an easy thing to do. And we might find ourselves envious of those who have that gift, the gift of saying the right thing at the right time. But if there's one area in particular where I think most people don't seem to know what to say, it's in regard to sin. More specifically, when someone commits a sin and you know about it, either because they have sinned against you personally or because someone has revealed their sin to you, in either way, in either case, you know what they have done. In such cases, what do you say? Well, thanks to God, he has given us the answers to those questions in the portion of his word that we are going to be looking at tonight, he has given us some very specific directions as to how to deal with sin and how to deal with sinners, especially when a Christian brother or sister commits a sin against you. The text is Matthew chapter 18, and it is so useful, so important to know that I hope it's not just a text that you listen to tonight, but it's one that, if you don't know it already, that you'll learn it, maybe even memorize it. It's that important. In fact, any pastor worth his weight in Bibles, and, and any Christian even, might already know when they hear the, the words Matthew 18, exactly what that's talking about. It's when Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin. Just between the two of you, if he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or tax collector. Amen, I tell you. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what do you say when someone sins against you? Well, according to Jesus, number one, you can't say nothing. But at the same time, number two, you shouldn't say anything until first you've said the right thing. Have you had this situation come up in your life? I would imagine almost every single one of us would have to say yes, maybe even on a number of occasions. Someone has said something or done something that has offended you. In your eyes, they have sinned against you. So what do you do? What do you say? The first inclination of some might be to, well, do nothing. Just let it slide. Don't say a word. But that doesn't deal with the problem, does it? It doesn't make the sin magically go away and disappear. The only thing that can take away the sin, as we know, being Christians, is repentance and forgiveness. The one who sins needs to repent The one who has been sinned against needs to forgive, just as God forgives us when we sin against him. The problem, however, might be that the person who has sinned against you might not even realize that they've done so. They might not realize that they've sinned 
against you. And even if they do know that they've sinned, maybe they don't realize how serious a matter that is and how much it has affected you and troubled you. With that in mind, you just can't say nothing. In fact, as hard as it might be, Jesus tells us the right thing to do if your brother sins against you. Go and show him his sin. Not an easy thing to do, is it? And maybe not something that we want to do either, but it's the right thing to do because it's the helpful thing to do. First of all, it helps you deal with that sin that has been committed against you. But it also can help the person who has sinned against you to deal with that sin as well. Oh, and and one more thing. It helps everybody else deal with that sin too. For what should everybody else do about that sin that has been committed against you by your brother or your sister? They shouldn't even know that it has happened. If you go to your brother or sister who has sinned against you and you deal with them individually, no one else needs to know, nor should they know, about that sin. That's why Jesus says, go and show him his sin just between the two of you. The reason Jesus tells us this, this, of course, is what's our human nature going to do? Our human nature wants to tell everybody else about that sin that has been committed against us. We want to tell everybody else before we go and talk to the person who has actually committed the sin. But there's a problem if we do that. If we first go and talk to everybody else, maybe, maybe we had that person who we think sinned against us pegged all wrong. Maybe we misunderstood what he said or what he did. Maybe we simply jumped to the wrong conclusion. And if we straighten it out with that individual, nobody else needs to know about what we thought in the first place. No one else needs to know what we thought that person did that was sinful in the first place. And even if it was a sin, let's say it was a sin, if they repent to us of that sin and we forgive them, again, nobody else needs to know that sin is no longer on the books. Unless we have, first of all, gone and told everybody else about it. And then if it turns out that the person hasn't really committed a sin, or even if they have committed that sin, they repented of it, now you got this problem. You got to go back to the people that you told your brother committed a sin and tell them that that sin is taken care of. Not only do you have to tell all those people that you first contacted, what about the people that they might have told and the people that they might have told and the people that they might have told and so on and so on. You see, when you feel that your brother has sinned against you, you really shouldn't say anything to anybody else until you first of all have gone to your brother, until you have followed the guidance of Matthew 18. What this does, it prevents gossip. It prevents rumors from spreading. It prevents molehills turning into mountains. And it also prevents you from sinning against your brother who you thought first sinned against you. Let me add something here too, because this is very likely going to happen in your life as well. Let's say you haven't sinned against anyone and no one has sinned against you, but you're brought into the middle of a Matthew 18 type type of circumstance because someone comes up to you and says, did you hear what so-and-so did? Well, if we're not the one who's been sinned against, nor are we the one who has sinned, it really shouldn't matter to us what so-and-so did. But what do our itching ears want to hear? We want to hear what so-and-so did. But as Christians, if someone says to us, did you hear what so-and-so did? Our proper response should be no, and I don't want to know. In addition... If a person comes to you with that kind of statement, did you hear what so-and-so did? Maybe we need to encourage that person not to be spreading that type of information as well. And perhaps we can be very pointed and ask, you know, did, did you talk to so-and-so about what they did? 
And that way we can encourage them to follow Matthew 18 as well and hopefully keep them from sinning against their brother or sister. See, the only time when we, when we ever really need to tell anybody else about a sin that has been committed against us is if we have first gone to an individual and confronted them about that sin and they have not repented. Then Jesus tells us to get somebody else into the mix. He doesn't say, go and blab it on the street corners, but he does say, if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or as a tax collector. In other words, give the individual who has committed the sin every opportunity available to repent before that sin ever becomes public. Because you know as well as I do, if a sin becomes public, it's probably not going to be forgotten. It's going to be with that individual forever. It's going to harm their reputation. And Matthew 18 is not about harming people's reputations. Just the opposite. Matthew 18 is all about repentance and forgiveness. It's all about showing love. Even the final step, if it ever gets that far, the final step, which we call excommunication, when someone, because they have refused to repent, is told you are no longer a communicant member of God's church, even that, is intended to bring the person to repentance as they hopefully find out this is really a serious matter. If the church is going to deal with it in such a way as this, maybe I had better repent of this sin. And if they do, then they receive that forgiveness. That should have always been our goal all along. What we're trying to do is get people who have sinned to experience the love and forgiveness that Jesus came into this world to win for us in the first place. Jesus went to the cross to bring love and forgiveness to the people of this world. Jesus went to the cross saying, Father, forgive them. And he wants us to forgive too. And that's why it's important for us to also keep in mind the last words of this text, at least the last portion that we are considering tonight. When Jesus says, amen, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Meaning when you tell somebody they are forgiven or not forgiven, that has pretty big implications, not just in regards to your relationship with this individual, not just in regards to their relationship with other people, but in their relationship with the Lord. This can have heavenly consequences. This can have eternal consequences. And if a person's soul is at risk, we are going to want to make sure that we do the right thing. And the right thing is to keep in mind what we learned from Matthew 18. The right things that we are to do when somebody sins against us. Number one, you can't say nothing. Number two, however, you shouldn't say anything until number three, you have made sure to first say the right thing. And that means going to the person to talk to them person to person before ever saying anything to anyone else. And then if the problem is not resolved, bring just one or two others into the mix. And only then would you bring it before the church, hopefully with the the ultimate goal of repentance and forgiveness. With God's help, may those directives be something for us to keep in mind in our lives so that we deal with sin properly, so that we keep ourselves and others from falling into further sins when we have been sinned against. That would be the most God-pleasing way to deal with any such situation. That's why we need to heed the message of Matthew 18. That's why I encourage you to memorize this portion of Matthew 18, because Sadly, like it or not, sooner or later, we're going to need it. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess that faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare the altar for Holy Communion. Please stand for prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, not knowing what to say is a problem all of us face at one time or another. Not saying the right thing is sometimes as dangerous as saying the wrong thing. That's why we appreciate your words to us in Matthew 18. Help us to put those words into action in our lives, dealing with sin head on, by speaking to the ones who have sinned against us, by not gossiping and telling others about sins that we don't need to know about and by always seeking the dual goal of repentance and forgiveness. As always, your perfect example guides us, and your forgiveness toward us should encourage our forgiveness toward others. In Christian love and concern, we also offer a prayer of intercession tonight for Debbie Arndt, sister-in-law of Paula Phelps, who has entered the hospital in Wisconsin with COVID-19. Knowing that Debbie has experienced a number of health issues in the past that make her more susceptible to the virus, we ask you to offer her an extra measure of strength and protection. Allow the health workers to give her what is needed to recover and increase her faith in you as the great physician. Also bless those who are working on vaccines for this dreaded disease and keep us all in your loving arms as we await the day when they finally arrive. We ask all of this for your name's sake, Lord Jesus, even as we now join together in your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. may be seated. We invite our communica members and our fellow communicants from our sister congregations in the wells to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. We respectfully ask that any other guests or visitors this evening please refrain from coming forward unless you spoke to one of the pastors prior to the service. Thank you.
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Good evening again to all of you. It's a pleasure to be back with you tonight. It's wonderful to see so many of you here this evening. 60, I believe, was the count. I don't think we've had 60 uh, since the first Thursday uh, when we came back in June. Hopefully we'll have as many next week as we celebrate Mission Festival. Yes, we are celebrating Mission Festival. Uh, we will do it with three services because we found somebody who was able to come for all three services. Uh, my son, who is going to be coming with his family, we just saw them last week, and when, my, when we left my daughter in Texas, there were a few tears because we weren't sure how long it was going to be until we would see them again. When we left Jared and his family, there were very few tears because it was going to be 10 days and we're, we were going to see them again. But they will be here next week for both the Thursday and the Sunday services. We hope that you will join us for that as well. God's blessings on the rest of your week. <laughs>